Hello everyone. Merhabalar. We are so hip, we are we are really happy to see you all here. Thank you so much for this great attendance. I'm Buse, Managing Artistic Director of Beykoz Kundura. As many of you know, um, the industrial side of uh, Istanbul, industrial heritage side of Istanbul, turned into cultural hub. And for creating the programs, we always get um, inspired by the history project, exploring all these um, performative elements of former workers and their rhythmic everyday life practice as kind of experts. So this sense encouraged us a lot to um, delve into and explore more in documentary genre in art practice. It's how our past cross with uh, the artist collective Rimini Protocol. So this evening we are uh, hosting Stefan Kegi, its co-founder and co-director for his lecture on transplanted performance and remote control audience. So by this talk, you will get more familiar with uh, their artistic approach and Stefan's creative universe. And already there are, uh, among you, already there are some uh, Remini Istanbul participants maybe, or any other Remini shows presented earlier in Istanbul, like Radio Museum by Idans, or the early one uh, about paper collectors uh, that produced by Garage Istanbul. It's been a decade ago, I guess, a long time. But uh, this talk has been a part of side events of uh, Remote Istanbul that we presented last September during pandemic uh, in collaboration with Kadıköy Municipality. So by this opportunity within your presence, once again, I would like to thank uh, to Remote team, to Stefan, Jörg, everyone for their belief, trust, and all that extraordinary effort in these unsettling times. Well, evidently within the second wave of um, outbreak, um, the series of performance uh, is not completed as scheduled due to sudden unforeseen uh, measures taken by government. But it's important for us actually to make it run at any pace by considering all our health and safety. But uh, we have actually designed it as a permanent production. So on and off, it will be running as much as the conditions allow us. So hopefully we keep our fingers crossed for uh, having better circumstances to resume, to restart in Istanbul, uh, hopefully for sipping time or summertime. And so while waiting, summer is coming. Uh, if you would like to push further and know more about Remote Rimini, there are some articles that we already translated in Turkish and interview uh, and we put them on our blog. So you can also access uh, for a limited time um, the Turkish subtitle of recording of Ankara Valley on our uh, blog uh, online on the um, on our website. It's also one of the recent projects that Stefan created. And later, by inspiring Ankara Valley, we will have some philosophical dis discussions on uh, online meetings about artificial intelligence, free will, individualism, and rights of robots compared to human rights and so on. Somehow it also covers a remote project as well. So little by little, uh, you will be prepared for remote mindsets to, uh, towards summer uh, sipping time. So stay tuned and thanks again everyone for attending and my dream team for making this event run smoothly. Thank you again, Stefan, for your time. Uh, enjoy. Thank to you very much. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's really special to be in this way in Istanbul. Um, I would have obviously appreciated a lot to be there uh, directly in a live. Now, so what shall we do? I, I just actually am a little bit confused because I hear the Turkish interpretation. Uh, maybe I just switch that off by, um, I think I put it inactive, so I think that should work. All right, so um, yeah, you said some words about Rimini Protocol, who we are. Um, I think I can directly dive into showing some projects because I think very concretely working in the projects, I, I, I guess it, it tells most about what we do. My own background actually is, is not so much in the theater in the very origin um, that maybe not so many people know. I, I, my first job was a journalist when I left school. 
and a little bit of this documentary interest still obviously remains in many of my projects, but later I started a little bit of, of, of arts and a little bit of theater and all of this comes together. But basically I think I left journalism not because I wasn't interested in research anymore, but because I like to um, create more interactive forms of sharing the contents that I find relevant to show to others. So talking about interactivity, I think I will talk about six different projects today. And um, I guess after every one of these projects, I'll open up the floor for a short to take two or three questions maximum um, so that I get a bit of a feedback. Is it understandable at all what I'm uh, saying or whatever your interest in those projects um, could be? But let's start right away and I will start sharing some screen here, uh, my screen here with some material. So Rimini Protocol, it's not just me, it's also Helgard uh, Haug and Daniel Wetzel as founding members. And then many other people that work together with us. We are not we're a free theater group. We don't have a venue of our own. We don't have a theater, but we try to find partners like Buse in Istanbul, but like many others for very particular project. Projects can take on very different uh, formats, but they often, I think, try to bring reality to theater or theater to reality somehow. Let's start by bringing reality to the theater. So imagine you would like to represent an entire city on your theater stage. Normally you might take some actors, but if you would like to, I don't know how many inhabitants does Istanbul have, maybe 12 million, 15 million, I don't know. Nobody knows probably really. Um, if you would like to display that entire city, uh, let's take Sao Paulo here, uh, you can see the statistics of Sao Paulo, then you would take such a statistic figures. In this case, um, it divides up here, and I hope you can see my cursor, into women and men. In Sao Paulo, there are, I think, 53% women and um, only 48, 47% men. Um, so you would need to have on your stage, if you would like to interpret, to represent the entire city, exactly 53% women on stage. In our case, for this particular project, which is called 100% um, Sao Paulo, uh, we represented the almost 12 million inhabitants of Sao Paulo with 100 people, because obviously a theater stage is not big enough to have the whole city to come in. Um, and so we, within this 100 people, we needed 53 women and 47 men, but also here you have color, which is a statistical figure in, um, in Sao Paulo or in Brazil in general. Uh, I don't know exactly, there are 2% of yellow, so, called, so they are mostly Japanese immigrants. Sao Paulo has a very strong uh, immigration wave coming from Japan, I think around the Second World War time. Um, but obviously a lot, uh, some, some of them are black here, I guess this is about 7% if I see that rail, and there are uh, about, what is that, probably, um, 25% of mixed mulattos and, and, and white. So again, we needed about, what is it, probably 60% of so-called white. It's by self-declaration, by the way. Um, civil state is another factor which we take into account when we try to make this casting for this show on stage. The area where people live, center, north, south, east of the city. And here is the H chart. So these five statistical categories make up the cast criteria for 100% city. Now, how does that look on stage? It looks very boring so far. Obviously, we don't show numbers, we show people. And this is our first cast member that we cast ourselves. He works for statistics as well. And he explains the rule of this performance and explains how he found, how we found the others. Escolhidos. A categoria mais difícil de encontrar foi homens 
com mais de 65 anos de idade e que moravam na Zona Sul. Eu, por exemplo, sou homem, moro aqui no centro, na Consolação, sou solteiro, tenho 44 anos, sou pardo. E usando um método de, de, um método de relação em cadeia, nós escolhemos 100 pessoas. E eu apresento aqui o Bruno, que é um amigo que eu conheci, é um praticante de budismo, da filosofia que eu pratico, e ele recita Não Me Horror Ninguém Que Eu Comigo, e eu o convidei para participar desse, dessa mostragem aqui. Bom, meu nome é Bruno, eu sou um futuro arquiteto, eu estou sempre em movimento, eu gosto de conhecer lugares novos, pessoas novas, sou viciado em novidade. E eu apresento a minha amiga Carmen. So basically you see, oh, this is not running on, I see. Um, while, while these people present themselves, um, you see more and more people coming on stage. Sorry, I kind of... A categoria mais difícil de encontrar. Oh, oh shut up. Okay. So I'll... Anyway, you, you would imagine this first scene going on and on, and one person after the other presents themselves. Um, they are... Uh, only having normally 10 seconds of time to present themselves because we it takes a long time when 100 people present themselves but you you could see already in the two first it's basically one person inviting the next and that's easy the next one is easy and the next and you tick box after box of these statistics that you saw before um and it gets more and more complicated because at some point you will realize oh We have already all the people that are married. We have all the people that are single, but we need widowers uh, or we need people from the northern area. And maybe the person that should recommend the next person in the chain reaction doesn't know um, where to find them. So the whole process of finding these hundred people, it takes us about um, half a year normally. And it's not really us doing it. It's in this case, the producers in Sao Paulo who make it because they go from house to house. Then after the recommendations of number one or number two to find the people. And after half a year, normally we manage to get a sample, a representative sample of 100 people on stage. Here is, and then we can, for example, represent the age chart the statistics about age. This is the oldest member of the cast we had in São Paulo on the stage. Zero, eu nasci. Agora eu vou dar oito passos, eu vou dar oito passos lá no centro para cada dez anos da minha vida. todos aos seus lugares prontos preparar já nós podemos representar São Paulo porque somos de cinco regiões diferentes so as you could see there is a kind of a vertical camera above the stage which allows us to see the statistics of age, for instance, in this situation. Um, so all the 100 people go more to the center if they are 80 or 70 years old, or they stay on the margins if they are kids or teenagers and so on. Um, so these are numbers as we know them. But obviously, it's also interesting, or, or for instance, here, I think she's introducing the map where do people live this is to show that we're really representative we exactly have accordingly this is a map of sao paulo city um, aqui nesse from... palco nós somos 19 da zona norte nós somos yeah. so you could see we have all the neighborhoods as well but these are statistics as we know them so let's go one step further and uh, we can also ask what do you do the whole day long um, how does the city move during 24 hours?
São Paulo às 9 da noite. São Paulo às 11 da noite. Yeah, so this is a perspective that you normally don't have, that you can't zoom out and see the entire city move. You only see maybe your neighbor or you see the people on the street. And the beauty of this project is that you kind of bring together the entire city and you see it moving. Moving. Well, it's Brazil. Some of them make some sexual movements. I'm sorry for that, but that's Brazil. <laughs> And then you see gradually they go to sleep. We can uh, a little bit go forward. This is one o'clock in the morning. Sao Paulo is quite a late city, but I'm quite sure Istanbul would even be awake later than Sao Paulo. This is two o'clock in the morning. Some people are still dancing. Sao Paulo, às três da manhã. Okay. I have to maybe explain that um, in uh, this project, we have only very short rehearsal time because all of these people, they have jobs, they are not actors. So whatever they do on the stage has to follow very simple instruction. It just gets complex because they do it in their way and they all do it in the very same moment. So it's kind of a, a picture of diversity, I guess, what's happening through this uh, project. But sometimes we also concentrate and we ask certain questions. For instance, here. Quem chorou nos últimos 15 dias? So who cried last uh, last two weeks? On the right side you see no, uh, not me, and on the left side you see me. Quem tem um animal de estimação? So everybody who has a pet now goes to the left side. And those who don't, those who are Quem come carne? Eu frequento hospitais com uma certa frequência. É, eu faço alguns exames. Na verdade, eu sou hipocondríaco mesmo. É, mas eu gosto de ter uma vida saudável, eu como muito bem, procuro me cuidar. É, vocês sabiam que a média mundial do consumo de carne por pessoa no mundo é de 42 quilos por ano. No Brasil, essa média é de 85 quilos por ano. Eu tive a sorte de, na infância, estudar em um colégio particular, e lá eles tinham uma preocupação maior com, com a saúde, com a alimentação. E eu pergunto... É, quais de vocês estudaram e estudam em escola particular? A big topic in Brazil, because obviously the public education is unfortunately not very good. Yeah, so we bring up some questions, and each question produces groups, groups of people that are have similar decisions, but often they're not necessarily for the same reason on the same side of these um, and so the audience that's kind of the beauty in the project can follow little heads and see ah okay the person who eats meat but he is also uh, saying th that he smokes marijuana and the later he's against uh, foreigners and then and you kind of build up an imagination or you can see the whole picture it's normally almost everybody in the audience has a different way of watching this this piece so here are some more groups in the last part of the show there is a band as well playing along and we see the groups
mentioned that you just saw is actually was a policeman himself and he said he has been to jail so it's also all these diverse biographies that in the same moment uh, cross the stage is, are very interesting now here we are in a different country in a different city Wangju, south korea uh, let's just compare a little bit So it's a very different um, performance in a different city, radically different in South Korea, because there is only 1% of foreigners living in Guangzhou. Uh, so, uh, and actually it's him uh, represented on our stage, um, who has a very interesting uh, history about why he was in jail, but it would go too far to, to tell it. Now you might say um, it's not always easy to, to stand up for what you are or what you feel like, for what you think in front of an audience. Obviously, statistics may always be falsified a little bit, but um, in front of an audience, it becomes a whole different topic. And so there are taboos, things you might not want to talk in front of others. And for this particular reason, we have uh, invented uh, a scene in the dark where they can vote anonymously. So in this scene, the performers have a spotlight in their hand and the vertical camera films from above how many people for answer with yes to this question, for instance. And um, obviously it's, um, you cannot see the faces, but you can ask questions that you may not elsewhere. And it's a very interesting question always to know which are the taboos in which city. In this uh, particular case, I was most surprised about the answer to this question, who would have a different partner in another life. So much, I asked why, and I wouldn't have asked this somewhere else. And uh, they explained to me that divorce is such a big taboo that you, it's not forbidden, but you may lose your job. And that's why it's uh, such a sensitive topic to, to be talking about. Yeah, basically this is 100% city as a project. And as I said, I think I will make a short stop and give you the chance um, if somebody has a question to ask um, the question. I think you would do this the best way if you would raise your hand, which uh, there is a little icon on the bottom, I think. And then we'll try to put on your microphone. Um, you can also just uh, make a suggestion which question uh, you would like to be answered by 100% Istanbul in the case. Uh, do you choose your questions according to each country? Um, yeah, so anyway, my answer is, um, uh, well, we have about maybe 120 questions that we are asking the, 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 the performers, the participants uh, in this performance. And I would say about 60 of them, they are always similar ones because they're questions about diseases, about do you have kids? Do you want to have kids? Um, are you unemployed? Uh, how long do you think you will still live? All of these questions can be asked everywhere around the world. And then there is about maybe 30, 40 questions that we adapt. And some questions we really ask only in a particular city because I think uh, it was in 
Indonesia in Yogyakarta, where we had the first time a performance of these 100% safety performances where we had 85% of Muslims. And apparently there was a big question in the society, do you want pre um, bef sex before marriage to be allowed? And uh, they suggested this question, I would never have thought of it. And uh, apparently I was very surprised that there in Indonesia, they, mm -hmm. the, the majority was no, we shouldn't allow it. Even the young people said so. So you find out a lot about these. Um, and then in other places mm -hmm. in Germany, for instance, nuclear power plants are a big topic. Whereas in France, nobody criticizes it really. So we worked together with dramaturgs and local artists to find out about these um, topics, about local questions. Maybe I just take the questions that I see here in the chat then. I realize that you switched the lights off during the questions such as the one about the sexual orientation. How do you make this decision to turn the light off and why? Uh, somebody here asks, but he, um, yeah, basically there are different kinds of taboos in each society. Um, for, in, for instance, sexual orientation in most of European countries, we can ask this question openly. Um, but in Poland, for instance, we had to ask it in the dark because uh, they were afraid of being beaten up when they leave the theater afterwards. Um, I, we also had uh, in, in, in Switzerland, for instance, money is a taboo. So we had to ask uh, in the darkness uh, questions about how much you earn. Whereas in um, America, nobody had a problem of, to talk about this. So it's really quite interesting, actually, where are the taboos? I, I wonder if um, somebody had uh, a suggestion what the taboo question would be. Uh, in Istanbul. Hi. So, so my 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 question is that um, you you do the performances uh, of a hundred percent city in the cities uh, where in which you're using the statistics to to represent. So so you represent the city for the citizens themselves. Uh, to my understanding, you take. 100% city in Sao Paulo and you do the performance in Sao Paulo. Uh, have, have, has any of those 100% city pieces toured anywhere? Have you taken the representation of one city and toured with it to other cities? Although I understand with the performers who have jobs and uh, you yeah. know real people yeah real uh, jobs it's it's it must be quite challenging but um have you ever yeah. considered taking that representation to other cities <laughs> we we saw we would never have thought of this because obviously it's very expensive to bring 100 people from one city to another but uh, actually it has happened twice already um, for two reasons. One was the performance you just saw a little excerpt of from South Korea, Gwangju. So uh, in Seoul, the capital of South Korea, they invited this performance with all the hundred people to come all the way to Seoul and show it in the National Theater. And um, so they organized a big bus to transport them. And uh, so it was quite special there to see the other city. And uh, also in Russia, we made the performance 100% Voronezh, which is a South, uh, South Russian city. And it got invited to the famous mask, uh, Golden Mask Festival. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, so it's, oh, they all traveled to Moscow and showed the performance there. But normally it, the whole idea of this piece is that we make it in the city and all the money that this performance costs because we are insisting on all the hundred people uh, being paid for it, it will happen in, um, in the city. Okay, I see more hands up, but maybe now uh, if we want to see some more, maybe we go a bit into further projects and um, you take a chance of the next chance to show um, your hands up. Okay, keep it for later. Maybe we have time in the end again to take some more questions. Um, I would like to talk about the very different format now of 
making visible the city. And this is a, a project um, in where we are leaving the theater and where we're going out in the city um, to listen to truck driver's story. Because I uh, here you can see actually two Turkish truck drivers that um, I found fascinating to meet when I did hitchhiking in, in uh, in, in, in uh, I think it was in Balkan somewhere where I met them and uh, I was traveling with them in, 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 in and, and they told me the whole their life and in the same moment they told a whole story about what it means to transport products that I normally only buy in the supermarket um, what it means to bring them all the way through Europe but if I wanted to make a performance about lives of truck drivers, I felt it needed to happen in a truck. So we bought an old truck. This is quite some years ago, as you can see. And we transformed it in such a way that the audience can sit at the back of a truck. This is in Basel and the truck drivers are uh, Bulgarians. And uh, here we see the audience at the back of the theater of Basel entering the truck. We are ready with Laden. Welcome in Bulgaria. My name is Sarcho. I'm from Bulgaria. I am uh, almost 22 years a professional driver. So now we are in Sofia. After one hour, we can be at the border. We can go. Um, yeah. I will start at third gear because the truck now is not loaded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, lady. Welcome in Sofia. So basically, you could see 50 people can sit inside this truck and they look um, now in one direction where at the beginning of the show you could see screens and these screens show here a uh, live camera from the driver cabin where these dri drivers are working um, and they say welcome to Sofia because on a dramaturgical level in the fiction we are traveling from Sofia through Serbia through uh, Croatia all the way Italy until Switzerland to arrive in Basel, which will take two weeks. This show does it in 90 minutes, um, driving only through the city of um, Basel. Welcome in Sofia. How that in Bulgaria? So, so after a while you can see that the screen are moving up and um, the audience sees Basel, but it, globalization make it possible that all around these cities um, all around the world, cities look the same where truck drivers move because they have uh, containers, truck ports. I travel to, to this country, the Serbian police used to stop me. Look out of the window and see Europa. That is a man, that is a show in a truck. Yeah. Die Kabine ist Hauptkabine und äh, das hier ist, dieser Druck ist für 26 Tonnen. So with the entire truck, we can almost like as if it would be a camera drive through the city and whatever is in front of, of this or at the side actually of the truck will turn into the stage of this performance. And we even drive into spedition companies Guten Abend, ich heiße willkommen bei der Firma Freude Möbelspedition. Ich heiße Ismail, meine Freunde nennen mich Easy. Jetzt hole ich mal einen Long Beach Tisch runter, den muss ich heute noch nach Frankreich schicken. 
So the second generation Turkish immigrant uh, living in Basel there, he works in the expedition company and always in the evening at nine o'clock when we arrived with the truck, he just got the microphone for five minutes, explained what he's doing. And then he had to co go on working and we drove on. So it's a whole kind of a life logistic experiment. We also wash the truck, as you can see. Bulgarian truck drivers here about 500 euro for one month. As you can see, there is a woman standing in the middle of the roundabout. It's a kind of a contra image to this male world uh, of trucks and of facts and of commodities and of deliveries and of just in time. Um, a Fata Morgana of somebody singing in the middle of a roundabout. In this case, it was a, even a Turkish singer. Um, and the truck is driving around and around and around. And uh, as there, she has a cordless microphone, so inside the truck, it feels like a concert almost. Uh, but all the other cars around were wondering, what is the truck doing? This is my son. <laughs> this is my wife. She is Turkish. I speak Turkish because we were together in Cyprus. Now I can speak with uh, many drivers. From Germany, from Hungary. This here means that this truck is loaded with dangerous goods. So in this uh, place, very close to the German border in Basel, huge queues of truck drivers are always out there. And obviously we could only guess that we will always try meet some truck drivers, but not whom we will meet. So this performance has a lot of very surprising everyday new elements uh, coming up um, during the performance. There is a musician on board that makes with his computer a kind of a live synchronization of the landscape outside the window. <laughs> Willkommen in Basel. We drive almost 2000 kilometers. We have 650 liters diesel verbracht. I've eaten more than 25 sandwiches. So, um, yeah, that's how the truck looks from outside. Um, we did the performance in many different uh, cities and whenever we make it, it's a long research in finding for this truck, this is like the setup, how people sit inside. Um, we do long research to find where uh, in, the, in the city to put kind of the dramaturgical red thread uh, through, through the city um, when we're performing this. Okay, I don't know, does anybody have a question around this project or wants to comment maybe? It, I feel it's a bit of a project that connects Turkey and uh, Central Europe a lot because uh, we have so many Turkish truck drivers on the road and I think it mainly is the fact, yeah, I don't know where it comes from actually, but. Arzu here has a question. Let's see if we hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, um, uh, I, uh, I'm a professor uh, and my students uh, interviewed a lot of truck drivers in my uh, oh. talk uh, 
uh, folklore classes and also in oral history classes. And it's a fantastic world. It's, it's incredible. And I think, um, you know, I never thought of that kind of a performance, but uh, I listened uh, to the life story, the narratives of many truck drivers uh, who travel from mostly Istanbul to Europe and to also Central Asia to other, uh, you know, other parts in the Middle East. So it's wonderful. I, it was very interesting to, to see how these two can connect, uh, you know, uh, both narratives, you know, because mm -hmm. in your performance, we watch it as a performance and we kind of experience um, the experience of the truck driver or the sense, get a sense of it. But their narratives are very interesting too, because uh, they are more in-depth narratives about many uh, memories that they have uh, piled up to, uh, in their life story. And, um, and many actually say, um, uh, this is my land. So they get bored when they are home. <laughs> They love yeah, their there is a certain addiction also to driving. Eh? People exactly. drive, and Very when addictive. you sit next to them, they start to to talk. Uh, yeah. It's almost a psychoanalytical process to be. Yeah. Um, but I will definitely refer to your work when I teach on. <laughs> okay. Yes, okay. Uh, we, we also collect uh, lots of stories on um, intercity bus drivers. You know, uh, which used to be very common. Um, before uh, all these uh, domestic flights were on uh, yeah. in, fa in favor, but we had uh, a kind of a long- the Truck drivers are even lonelier in a way because they are not speaking to anybody uh, yeah. normally. But the, yeah. they have their kitchen, they have their bed, yeah. they have this little mobile home, uh, which they, um, they kind of embellish uh, in different ways on during you know, during different uh, uh, episodes of their lives. So they are very proud also of their own trucks. So uh, you can see how they- um, Yeah, it's also about decorations inside exactly. the truck, that's the whole world. Um, especially Turkish drivers that I met, they always had these carpets in the front exactly. and they make chai in the inside. Thank you very much. That yeah. was very, very- My fun. pleasure. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Somebody wrote, I think, in this concept, it probably was not so easy to maintain a position which you are not orientalist or superior. Hmm. Well, that's a question. I mean, actually, why would I be superior to a truck driver? Because what I found very interesting is that in this project, the performers have a lot of power. <laughs> they have the steering wheel. And if they push the brake, the whole audience is kind of, uh, so it's, I, I would say it's more a kind of an empowerment. Um, I think you can try to understand worlds which you're not born into. Uh, it's not that worlds can't communicate um, just because I don't know how to, actually, I don't even know how to drive a normal car. So it's a really far away world. But that doesn't, I hope, lead to an exotic position. This is an answer to Chidin's uh, question here. But um, maybe uh, I go to the last project before we make a little break, um, which is also about bringing performances into the city. And actually, it's kind of a trailer to the project which hopefully very soon you can see again in uh, Istanbul. It was just paused by Corona, unfortunately. Um, so it's a project where in this case you don't go in a truck, but you walk also with 50 people together, but you walk through the city and everybody has a headphone of the audience and together you start walking and you listen to um, a kind of an artificial intelligence, at least to a computer voice that guides you in this case through Berlin. Just a quick. Welcome to Remote Berlin. My name is Rachel. 
I sound a bit artificial. Sorry. I am not human. But I will try to be your friend. I'm programmed for you. I'm programmed so that you will always find your way. Let yourself be carried by the music. The others are doing it too. They join you and you flow onwards together. Zero degrees. Turn with the sound, slowly, like a security camera. 90 degrees. Scan your surroundings. 180 degrees. If you left your thoughts on my hard drive, I could talk for you after your death. Your ideas could live on. But this time without doubts, without pain, without the others. So, as you can see, this um, artificial voices, as we know them from GPS uh, navigators and similar, uh, she takes us through the city, but she also makes us interact and even choreographs some of the movements um, of the audience. And um, I think it's an ideal transition uh, to the break because a voice that seduces you to make some movements uh, might be perfect for you right now because you've been sitting in front of the computer almost an hour now. Um, and this is why uh, Buza was so kind to translate into Turkish a work that I invented uh, at the beginning of the lockdown, because at the beginning of the lockdown, I was sort of frustrated of being not able to move and especially not having physical experiences anymore. Um, because, um, yeah, we were not meant to even leave our house in some point and uh, this whole haptic component uh, of theater was lost because we were only in Zoom sessions like these where it seems only our the upper part of our body exists so um, there is an audio tour it takes seven minutes and now I would like to invite you to take a little break and we'll make a break of 10 minutes also so that the poor interpreter has a little bit of a break um, and during this break you are invited to you actually should have received the email by now i hope this worked out and otherwise if you haven't received the email you can actually just type this link that you see here uh, and i would suggest you to listen to it not on your computer but to, on your mobile device and have a, a headphone so that you can actually uh, listen to it and do follow the instructions because all of these instructions are to be performed in your own home alone and then afterwards we meet again and we can talk about uh, your experiences with this or maybe with remote istanbul if some of you have already seen it i think here we are back i see that still some spectators are around i hope um that you managed to do the, the audio tour any comments or questions around that i don't know what it means in a turkish household to try it there but i find it somehow it's, it was a bit of an experiment to invent a site-specific audio tour for a place that obviously i don't know precisely because i don't know your homes but uh, everybody has a bed, I guess. Everybody has a window. And um, so I don't know if somebody wants to tell how their tra travel through, through their own home worked or if it didn't work at all. I don't know. Or it would also be the moment if you want to generally talk about the question of audio tours of uh, intervention in particular places with uh, a different audio world. Um, maybe some of you have seen remote Istanbul. 
which actually I haven't seen, un un unfortunately, because it was my colleague, uh, Jörg Karrenbauer, who has um, staged it. Okay, well, as far as I can see, there's no direct reactions. Then, okay, somebody says here something in Turkish. Okay, somebody in Tigidem enjoyed the transformation of the spaces. Huh? Yeah, it's, uh, it was a bit my emergency solution, not being able to transform realities inside a theater in last March and April. I thought, okay, I'll just transform my own space or the space of the people that I sent this audio tour to. What I find kind of interesting is that obviously normally we're working in a theater, which is a public space or even in, in re remote projects, we work inside the, the public space out there. But these, um, the, 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 these spaces were not access accessible anymore, which made me really sad. I thought actually in the Corona crisis, we should have taken use of theaters, of places where we can actually in a controlled way obviously under very hygienic situations not with hundreds of people in the same moment but we, we should use these places just in, in a new way so that still a kind of a common experience could be possible and that doesn't only work through computers in a similar way um, I transformed um, some years ago a theater into yeah almost a public space because I was wondering why do public construction sites create problems so often. Um, we here in Berlin we have the Berlin airport which has actually finally opened um, last well, two months ago but we have been waiting for it for eight years and the costs were totally overrun in a similar way in Paris the Philharmonie de Paris built by Jean Nouvel is a disaster in terms of costs exceeding so very often um, public constructions produce very very big complexities and I thought I let's try to create a kind of a model inside a theater space um, to understand why this is happening. So I will dive into a project that is called um, Society Under Construction, mm -hmm. or here it's the French version, Société en Chantier. And what you see on the right bottom, it's a kind of the stage design that Dominique Huber, a close collaborator in um, especially immersive projects uh, like the ones I will be focusing now on the second half of this talk on. Um, he often collaborates with me to transform indoor spaces in such a way that they become kind of models of something. Each colored group of little pillars that you see in this sketch represents one spectator of this show. There are about 300, 400 visitors that can see it normally. And um, every 10 minutes you change the perspective in this thing. Let's go into it concretely. So the, the audience is divided in eight different groups and they receive, for instance, hard hats, as you can see the yellow ones here, and they have headphones inside. So you kind of start to look like a construction site worker. And in the same moment, you become um, a listener of one of eight groups in one big common space. Diese Großbaustelle wird einen Heißhunger nach Sand entwickeln. Sand, der gebraucht wird für die Aufbereitung des Baugrundes, aber auch zur Landgewinnung. So the man you just saw speaking, he's an urbanist, an urban planner, and one of these groups uh, listens to him, while in the same space seven other groups listen to other experts of construction site. And each time somebody tells you it's contradicting what the others give you as reasons why the construction site delays. 
Sie suchen alle möglichst nach sicheren Anlagealternativen zum Kapitalmarkt. So, die Situation ist also heute so, dass wir hier einfach zu viel Liquidität im Raum haben. Zu viel Geld. Die städtischen Mitarbeiter. This is one of the big problems why our cities like Istanbul are transforming a lot because uh, people invest into concrete. As the banks have very low interest rates, if you have money, you try to build something, uh, even if sometimes it's not used. Um, and obviously in growing cities, it's uh, more complicated. And investors often then decide more about how a city transforms than the real citizens that inhabit it. So we had somebody that's consulting banks and shareholders on how to invest money. But this person you see here, he's actually working for Transparency International, a group that tries to fight against corruption uh, that proves in some of his stories um, how construction sites become places that harbor and breed corruption. Now, all of these groups move in the same moment, so they interact as well. You will see how. Ich bekommen von der Unternehmerin, dass in solchen Fällen übliche Schmiergeld in der Baubranche. 1% der Auftragssumme, 50.000 Euro. Ich übergebe die erste Rate. Fresh Money nennen wir das. Jetzt kommt das Spiel. Jeder Hunderter steht für 10 Millionen Euro. So the money he throws becomes a prop for the other group that are for these 10 minutes the investors and then later they change it to another position. Nicht so bei den Ameisen. Ameisen wissen genau, was sie tun müssen und die bauen genau in der Zeit, in der sie auch einen neuen Bereich des Nestes benötigen. Wissen Sie, woran kann man erkennen, ob auf einer Baustelle Schwarzarbeiter sind, wenn ohne Gerüst gearbeitet wird? Weil von einer Gerüst kann man nämlich nicht so schnell fliehen, jedenfalls kommt jemand in Kontrolle. So here you can see that the audience even constructs something during the evening that is growing while the performance is going on. And as they are constructing, they're listening to the story of uh, somebody who is actually from Romania originally and has been working illegally on construction side the last four years of his life. And it tells, again, a very different story about the construction site than the investors 10 minutes before. Vielleicht kennt mich der eine oder andere aus der Presse. Ich habe die Entrauungsanlage am Berliner Flughafen geplant. Und die soll an allen Schuld sein. Nehmen Sie die Tafel mit zwei Händen und wedeln Sie ganz kräftig dem Vordermann richtig viel Wind in den Rücken. Sie sehen, überall auf der Baustelle streitet man sich, dass es qualmt. Jetzt sind Sie der Angegriffene. Sie sind jetzt angegriffen. Was müssen Sie jetzt machen? Blocken, Handkante. Yeah, so the last person you saw is actually a lawyer um, who defends the public hand against um, extra costs that private companies often claim. Um, but he's also a karate fighter in his hobby, so he uses this karate to uh, explain to the audience how to defend against such uh, problems. I guess there could be a lot talked about corruption in construction sites in Turkey as well, like, like in all the countries, I would say. I don't know if somebody has a story around that or wants to comment. I'll quickly see if I see any hands up. Any questions, any comments there? The world out there remains silent. It's quite a big project where we normally, the interesting thing is that you kind of transform the entire theater into something that looks as if the theater would be reconstructed or changed. Um, and uh, often for theaters, actually, it is the case that they need to reconstruct themselves. And uh, 
audience is often a bit scared, like what's 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 going on here because it's so immersive. But I think in many of my projects, what I really enjoy is when the theater develops around you, all very close around you. And when you can touch it and when you can do things, I just recently heard a researcher telling how much actually we are driven not by what we think, but to keep our hands busy. We can think better when we touch things, when we do things. I don't know if at this moment when you're listening to me or maybe drawing things at the side of uh, the computer to keep your hands busy, which is a kind of a natural thing. And I think this kind of presence in a theater space to me is more logic, the one where you do something uh, than the so-called classic theater position where you're sitting in the dark and sitting and just observing and watching. Uh, I see there is a big Turkish commentary here. I don't know if there's something I can react to in the chat. If I should, then well, I'll switch on the English channel. Maybe I hear a translation, I don't know. Ah, Charlie Kaufman, Cynic Dog. Yeah, 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 I see it. It's funny that you mentioned this film because um, I was actually uh, just yesterday again trying to see if I can find it somewhere online because it's um, already been recommended to me three times, but I haven't watched it. I know more or less how it works, so I can guess where your question is aiming at. Um, yeah, I think sometimes we, we try to really do make these kind of collaboration and interaction out in a city and sometimes we try to make it in a in a in, to build buildings like as, as far as i know in this film you have different floors and people are kind of playing together from window to window as far as i've understood um, and actually um an example where we did this very in a very elaborate format um, is a project that is called Situation Rooms. Uh, maybe I show a little bit uh, of this project. It's a project where we were trying to understand how weapon trafficking works. Um, Germany is known as a country that normally tries not to get involved in wars, but actually Germany is the third biggest producer of weapon in the world. So it's a bit naive maybe when Germans think of them as a peaceful country, just because they're not involved in a war. Commercially, they're involved in many wars. Um, now, when you ask about where to deliver and not to weapons, um, there are a lot of debates also between Germany and Turkey, often on the official level. So we thought, let's try to make an international model of weapon traffic and about the biographies that are produced by such uh, trade. And we did it in a very immersive project that is smaller scale than the one you just saw because it's only for 20 audience members at a time. And it's a kind of a mixture between film and reality because we built a film set, uh, maybe like the Char Charlie Kaufman film on, on two floors in our case, not in an entire city, but on two floors. And uh, we built about 15 different rooms in which 20 protagonists of weapon trafficking tell their stories in spaces that were built to reconstruct the places where they normally live. So the protagonists are, for instance, these ones. Uh, 
Das braucht man, um in den Krieg zu ziehen. Nachtsichtgerät, feuerfeste Unterwäsche, Splitterschutzweste, Mut, Gottvertrauen, Sanitätsausrüstung und Ausbildung. Man muss eben wissen, dass es immer gefährlich werden kann. Genevon. Ils m'ont ramené aux frontières de Rwanda pour me former à être soldat. Früher habe ich Waschmaschinenteile gemacht. Heute machen wir Hightech-Waffenteile. Und die Arbeit war eigentlich genau das Gleiche. Du weißt, dass es immer über die Fans ist, dass es jemanden gibt, der dich eigentlich zu töten will. So, wenn du die Menschen in diesem Film siehst, sind sie actually spectators they are not the protagonists but they see uh, on their ipads that they hold in the hand the protagonists sometimes but mostly just their hands or um and they do reenact them walking through these places so Again, Dominic Huber, the set designer, he built places like this field um, hospital to tell the story of a doctor, for instance, uh, who worked a lot in Sierra Leone. But he, if you just go through the door, you are in a room that represents uh, Mexico or Gaza Stripe, and you hear a very different story there. And you interact with each other because each of these films that the people see on their iPads, they were shot in the same seven minutes. And so when the protagonists interacted with each other, the people that now watch their films, they also interact with each other. Look at the mirror. Look at the mirror. I'm a hacker. And now I have another pseudo body, which is yours. Anfangs von den 80er Jahren, beim ersten Golfkrieg, da haben sie gezeigt, wie Teheran verteidigt worden ist. Auf einem Hoteldach oben habe ich gesehen, dass da ein Geschütz steht. Und es war eines von unseren Geschützen, wo wir seinerzeit im Schlag geliefert haben. Wir sind jetzt über die Tarelke so stehen. Walk over to him and say hello. Ujambo. Abarizako. Sasa ni ambie. Kif ana wassalat lahum. An jamia anha hunus. Tuwajjahu. An nas. La sahat. La saha. Li yamlu mitl. Hai al muzahara. Wa amalna kan. Bit taghir. Al mazadini. D'un coup, il y a des coups de balle et des professeurs paniqués. Par terre, par terre Tout d'un coup, il y avait des métiers qui sont rentrés. Ils ont commencé à tabasser des professeurs, torturer des professeurs à mort. Donc moi, j'ai cherché à fuir là. Ils m'ont récupéré, ils m'ont dit, non, maintenant, maintenant, c'est pas vos papas qui ont soldat, maintenant, c'est vous. So these situation rooms, um... They are now a transportable installation, which we sometimes build up somewhere else. It's quite a lot of material. It's um, two containers full of material, and we build it up somewhere. And then every two hours, 20 spectators can go inside them, and you go through the lives of 10 of the 20 protagonists we had. And all of these simultaneous actions that you have with others um they are a bit portrayed in this in this diagram it's part of our kind of major script of the piece because to produce these simultaneous films we needed to calculate where is the other so that i can for instance reenact a handshake between two of the original protagonists of the film which then will happen every seven minutes and that's why you have these color marks and so it's a timeline from top to bottom and there are tw these 20 parallel films that, that uh, we step into in, in a way. Yeah, it's a bit of a complicated project to explain if you haven't been inside, maybe Buse later can sell, say a little bit about her experience because you actually saw it as far as I know. 
Um, but I see a little feedback here in the chat room by uh, Gülsen uh, Akbal, who says that actually um, it is a continuation of journalism, what I do with other means, and I would totally agree. In such a project, yes, it is a documentary format, um, but I uh, must say I'm very lucky not to be working for my newspaper anymore these days because it was a small newspaper and we had to produce very fast news. And so I couldn't do deep researches as I can now in making these projects, which sometimes I take two or three years to produce it with my colleagues together. Mm. I also see a big advantage of creating formats where you have an attention of 90 minutes of an audience as opposed to newspapers that are often now just like, you know, you read it in a very quick way through. So, but still I do admire very much and connect to the way journalists uh, work. This was reacting to one message here in the chat. I don't know if somebody wants to say something, comment, maybe I switch this off a moment. May I just jump in? More free. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, well, I'll just make a quick comment and ask a question about situation rooms. Well, it was a fascinating experience for me. Like I had really enjoyed and was really, um, it's definitely different than what we read beforehand. You know, it's just it's, to be understood, it must be in there, you know, experience. I was actually wondering how did you find the protagonists? And it's quite difficult to persuade them. And also you film them in the set, right? In order to um, create that visual material. And also like um, on the other hand, it's, it's kind of like, it could be a VR project also at the same time. So why this iPad uh, tool you preferred and why filming? So, and how actually um, these protagonists can, could somehow like uh, admit to be a part of the project. So, yeah, just a quick comment. On yeah, out of these 20 people, I mean, it was very easy to find some of them because if you look for um, people that are activists against weapon, for instance, they have an interest to speak. So it's easy. You go to Amnesty International, you find people, politicians that speak against weapon. It's easy to find uh, refugees who have stories to tell how they suffered from weapon. It's uh, relatively, we have a lot of them, unfortunately, so it's easy to find. But for us, it was very important also to have people who use actively weapon and who defend the use of it, which is maybe not, at least here in Germany, it's not something that everybody would be proud of. And um, it's even much more complicated to find people that work for weapon factories who would speak up in public. So it took us a long research to find these people. Um, and in some cases we had to change their names. Um, for instance, as a manager of a Swiss manufacturer of air defense weapon, who was only able to take part in this project uh, with a fake name because otherwise he would lose his job. There was also a Mexican murder, we have to say, from a drug cartel who had to appear in an underchanged name. The real experiment was really to film this all together because different from a documentary film, we needed to shoot it all in one day and actually in seven minutes. So we a lot of preparation, but then we brought all of these people from Pakistan, from Mexico. We brought them together for one week to Berlin. And during this time, we we elaborated with them really the the main part of this uh, this project you said augmented reality yes in a way it feels very much like augmented reality but uh, actually our project is very low tech because we just have 20 films on 20 ipads it's very elaborate how they are timed and how they are pro produced these films but it doesn't, it's not interactive. You cannot change the speed of it, which is kind of probably the, the kind of theater condition in this that you, you go through an experience that is precisely timed. 
follow the rules and therefore get seduced to something which you wouldn't exactly find for yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And reactment it's also is a kind of issue, right? Bad, when it comes to African soldier, especially uh, for that protagonist. How does that work? The acting, is that what you said? Reactment. Because for filming, they actually uh, react, right? Those, for instance, yeah, the African soldier I mean part. The child soldier. I understand what you mean. Yeah, he kind of goes through in this. Yeah, in this case, it's a former child soldier who steps again into the kind of position, and um, yeah, it's a traumatic experience that he kind of goes through again. Um, actually, we were quite in exchange with the of killing. I don't know if you probably saw that, but at some point, who became kind of a pioneer of what reenactment of a war situation does it's a film tour shot in indonesia about the 80s where commerce the chinese as they call them were, well very interesting film maybe we go into the last project i will talk a bit about which is even more immersive in the sense that it's even more small we're getting from very one stage becoming becoming very narrow and very intimate and it's a project i created in switzerland a country that has a very special relationship to death and i think it's interesting to look at it today because we the whole society the whole world is kind of trying to fight death very actively but when you look at the, the death rates in a historical or at the pregnancy actually you see that we've become older and older and older and especially in switzerland people i think the average person is uh, expected to live around uh, 85 or 87 i think in, when it comes to women years long whereas 100 years ago um, like already I would be dead now statistically um, because the average life expectancy in the late 19th century in Europe was around uh, 35 years, I think. Um, so there is a very, people become very old in Switzerland, but in Switzerland also they have the option to decide about when and how to die. Um, by themselves if they have a terminal disease. So there is this uh, kind of legal possibility to have a doctor give you medicine and you die before the machines would stop you or, or the machines could still make you live much longer, but you are legally, you can decide on a, on a kind of suicide um, in, in a dignity dignified way as, as they would call it so we said it's an interesting country to look at um, at our relationship to the world after we've passed away so i created this project that is called nachlas nachlas it's some it could be translated as legacy or as heritage and when you come into this installation you see eight doors, you see uh, countdowns um, above the doors, and whenever they come to zero, the, one of the doors would open. And then you can go in, into a place where you listen to the story of somebody who knew when we worked together that they wouldn't live much longer, or quite certainly he knows for sure, but quite certainly knew that they might soon die. Some of them because they planned to die, some of them because they had a very heavy disease, others because they had to do very risky hobbies. Well, that's, and basically you come in there and you they start to speak, but they are not there. That's why the subtitle of the piece is Rooms Without People, because the people that you see again are spectators uh visiting absent protagonists who in many of the cases are not alive now as we're speaking about the project 
So let's go into it for a moment. Je doute de te voir adulte un jour. Je n'ai jamais vu quelqu'un qui est mort sur les réseaux Facebook. Rest in peace. Mardi prochain, 18 août, je vais aller en Suisse pour mourir. Est-ce que je me défais de ce que je possède Mon corps disintégrate. Full stop. Ce sera l'éternité. Alors on n'aura plus besoin de réveil quand on sera au paradis. Ich weiß, ähm, meine Zeit ist jetzt ähm, und, und ich möchte das Beste aus dieser Zeit herausholen. Peut-être je ne vais pas devoir grandir. J'aimerais que tu gardes de, de moi une, une image de quelqu'un de, de bien vivant, de quelqu'un de bien dans la nature. Je t'embrasse fort, ma fille, et, et j'espère que tu euh, profites de la vie. Meiner Sack. <laughs> Would you want to be alive when you were no longer emotionally involved or remembered nothing, not even the names of your children? Je veux décider moi-même à quoi servira mon héritage et je souhaite vraiment qu'il poursuive après la mort le travail de ma vie. So you could see in between that there is actually again also one little connection to Turkey in this project because there is uh, one man, a very old man, living in Zurich since 50 years. But uh, he has decided that um, in the after his uh, death, he wants to go back to Istanbul, which is where he was has grown up. Uh, and he already owns um, a, uh, a grave for the whole family in a nice, beautiful cemetery, actually. So we went to visit his grave together with him to, um, yeah, to look at it. He had a very positive view on the death, actually. Um, you could also hear the story of somebody who has this hobby of jumping from the mountains and opening the parachute in the very last moment. Wingsuit jumping, it's called. It's very dangerous. He has already left, lost 40 good friends by opening the parachute basically too late. Um, but he still does it and he has an insurance uh, that will allow his family to live on well, as he said. Uh, so this Obviously, the way we plan to die or don't plan to die or don't want to talk about how it is to die, it also speaks about our lives. So in the end, it's also a portrait of eight very different people that are somehow present in these rooms without exactly being there. Yeah, I guess death is, is in a way a, a topic that comes back in many of of uh, our performances, it's in the end our basic question in the end, why is there life and why is there death? Uh, so remote also has uh, a beginning normally on a cemetery. I don't know, do we start in a cemetery? In, yeah, I think we start in a cemetery, right, in Istanbul? Um, no, <laughs> we start from the park. Okay. Okay, different. <laughs> we often do it, though. but it's it's it it has uh, the, the the computer voice that we listen to often. It talks also uh, a bit about about how long do we live? Ah, yeah, it's just see uh, I said that confirms that remote also talks about it. 
And there is another Turk commentary in Turkish by Kundura. I, oh, yeah. Oh, it's English. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You just say that we can, that you can. Okay. So, yeah. And actually, maybe just to complete the topic of death around a little bit is that. Uh, if you have the chance, I think, I don't know where it will uh, and when it will happen, but uh, as Buza already mentioned, there is this project Uncanny Valley um, that has been subtitled in Turkish language and will be available online. Obviously, it's not the live performance because the live performance is, uh, is happening at the moment in Chile, in Santiago de Chile. Um, but the recording is quite well and it's a one hour piece. And it's also very much about what humans, how do humans replace themselves or what in, then again is replacing ourselves when we have robots. Uh, it's a performance where only a robot is on stage. If you want, I can show some pictures of the robot without, so the, the main question behind this project is uh, this one like, how to make a copy of yourself because I worked with a German writer, Thomas Melle, who has a particular mental condition of being um, bipolar between depression and mania, um, and with whom we created a robot to copy him. And how did we do this? this these are some pictures of the roboticist take, taking pictures of him to study how his body basically is built. And uh, then we made a silicon copy of his face uh, in collaboration with the theater in Munich. And uh, we built the hands, everything, and we built 32 engines inside this body. That uh, here you see the inside of the body. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, just a little bit here you see how how the body moves. Uh, that's uh, some pictures of the process of how the body was made. Yeah, here you see the robot on stage. And as you see, the head is kind of open at the back and obviously when you watch this performance, you also reflect a lot about the question. The Japanese roboticist Masahiro Mori calls the scale of variation, whereby a robot resembles a human, but not enough, therefore causing aversion and alienation, the uncanny valley. If you've... Yeah, so basically it's a reflection very much of how much can we replace what we do by machines, which is probably happening in many jobs already. Um, yeah, and how much do we want to replace ourselves by machines? But hopefully you can see the whole performance on video soon somewhere. Um, voilà. Yeah, so basically this was my talk, but you can talk if you want to say something, comment, ask. Ah, oh, yeah, here's a question by Boda Aksu. I want to ask a general question on your work. What do you think about the distinction between spectator and performer? Do you think that your projects are built on egalitarian structure that uh, eliminates the distinction? No, I would say, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, because obviously some, in some of my pieces, uh, of our pieces, uh, the perform, the, the audience becomes almost like a protagonist because they do things, but I think what they do is still very different from an actor because an actor obviously does a, has a whole long process of preparation to, to speak a text, to represent uh, somebody. Whereas in our pieces, the physical movements that you do interacting as you did it in the break, um, standing on your bed or 
looking out of the window, you do things, but it's more that you you move your body, um, which keeps you thinking, I would say, or you you might even say something at some point, but it's it's kind of directed in the moment, so you don't have to prepare for it. So I think there is still a very clear distinction between protagonists that we have on stages and uh, and the spectators that you are. I see somebody is rising. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to ask if, um, do you define your work as a politic theater or a kind of a politic event maybe because you know your work was totally is uh, really uh, about the reality and the reality connects with politics all the time and uh, your work is totally and the documentaries so are really amazing they are uh, so i really wonder that you know like piscator or the uh, trite uh, Okay, uh, what do you think about, you know, like uh, Piscator did before in the past about politics side? Can you find any connection with this style, with your work? <laughs> That's interesting that you mentioned Piscator. I mean, uh, when did Piscator die? <laughs> <laughs> I have never seen a performance. By yeah, Piscator. yeah. I only know it from books. And I think books are very... Mm -hmm poorly representing what what theater makes because theater is happening in the end uh, it's a live event as far as i know he did a lot of simultaneous activities um right um, you you may maybe know more about Piscator. yes so this connects <laughs> to some of the projects that i talked about tonight but i don't know more than that about him so i couldn't say but your other question was is it political i guess yeah i mean uh, i guess we if we want or not we are all political beings because uh, we vote or if we don't vote it's also an option and it also has an influence on politics if we behave or if we speak up or if we whatever we do it we are social beings and if we leave the house or not during a lockdown it has an input or an output it produces things on others so i guess also what we do in theater does have um, an output but maybe when we talk about political theater um, some people speak about you know brecht and uh, or peter weiss in germany i don't know who would be the turkish authors to stand mm -hmm, for that mm -hmm. kind of political theater that wants to push you ideologically in one direction and there I would say I'm a bit more on the journalistic side being a journalist that tries to hear the different positions and make bring them together as I'm interested in the conflict between them but I'm not interested in judging who is right and who is wrong and giving you know, forcing an opinion on you, because I think uh, Germany, for instance, has in mm -hmm. theater a long tradition of moralistic theater. You know, Lessing has said uh, the theater should be a moralistic institution. And I don't think that we have to educate the audience in that sense, that we have to teach them what to think. I think we have to create uh, um, a kind of a platform where they are able to open their eyes and 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 start to think for themselves. I guess there is. Uh, I don't know. Should I take your food? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Do you want to speak? Hello. Can you, yes. can you can you hear me? I can hear you, yes? Yes, uh, firstly, uh, briefly, I'd like to say that uh, I did these nine movements in first days of Corona. So uh, it was different experience from me, uh, different from now, from today, because, you know, uh, I already going for a run now and just doing something. Uh, first, I'd like to say that. And the other question is uh, architecture wise, theater architecture wise, you know, because Milorao uh, has an invitation about the 
theater architectures and making theater in public space uh, and reading about the architecture, theater architecture uh, regarding Corona crisis. So what do you think about uh, this calling and because you uh, already organizing different interviews uh, with architecture faculty and uh, you have an interview about uh, so and what do you think about the uh, status of theater post corona yeah it's a bit cliche question but i really wonder what do you think yeah i mean you started with architecture obviously the there are the, the classical theater architecture that is built to have as many people sitting as close as possible to each other is under question very much um i do think it's a great moment to start thinking how to make theater outdoors um i hope that next summer we will see a lot of activities outdoors i myself i'm thinking about producing a little festival out in nature because i think there we don't need the stage necessarily for theater um it is a very you know when you look back in the it's, it's funny that people when they talk about the proscenium arch theater they speak about the classical stage often or at least here but when we look at the Greek theater, I mean, you know, we have in Turkey quite some of them. Um, they, they are not frontal. They are not uh, in the classical kind of illusion uh, yes. art situation. And they are immer they are much more immersive, and they're meant that you see each other, not that you're hidden in the darkness. And in Middle Age, there was a lot of theater uh, happening uh, that are walking through villages and cities and maybe we should reenactivate more of these forms also to be visible to people that are not from the scene that are not only the cultural audiences i think there is a lot of potential there but i'm not saying we should destroy all the theaters and not use them anymore i have a kind of a emotional attachment because i myself have spent a lot of times inside theaters and I actually just finished a project called Black Box, where I feature these empty palaces of culture. They, they also resonate in, a, in an interesting way uh, in this Corona situation, the, the absence of the masses that we, yeah, that we miss so much. I don't know what theater will look like after Corona. I mean, some people have said, let's, it all must be different after. I do understand also that some, some of the things that were there before, I would also be happy to get back. But I, I think it, is, it has definitely given us some impact to try out things, digital experiments. We will just have an opening next week uh, in a Zoom format of a project that is called Kolkata at Home. It's a performance that happens only on Zoom. I think it's not bad to do these kind of experiments, but I, I, I am looking very much for moments when we meet physically again. I, I do believe about the sensual impact that brings us together because I think flat screen things, the cinema can do first of all better than theater, maybe with some exceptions. Excuse me, I wrote my uh, question in chat. Ah, okay. Uh, where? But uh, in Turkish, can you translate for me, please? Ah, yes. Uh, please translate. I'll go into English mode here. Or I so can. I the translate, but you can. It's better. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting question, because in a way, if I think of artificial intelligence, the first thing that comes to my mind is actually theater. Because what is artificial intelligence? It is a, an attempt to anticipate what people will feel, what will they need, and prepare direct reactions to that in a way. 
so you make a sad scene in theater, you use a certain music, you anticipate that they will feel this or that way. So there is a strong connection. Now, frontal proscenium arch theater normally doesn't interact. So it, they, there's only one option how the scene can end where you are sad and where this music is being played. So the people go through it, they have their catharsis and then they clap in the end. Um, in interactive forms, you kind of try to open up different branches, almost like in game designing after GTA, um, there were moments where the open world kind of games op allowed you to go in all kinds of different directions and the game offers you all kinds of reactions to how you behave. Um, so I, I think there is a lot of possibility in this world. But just to be clear, I'm not saying we should replace this kind of artificial, classical artificial intelligence that is just theater directing in the end by programmed and uh, computerized uh, artificial intelligence all over the place. I think it's interesting to do this once or twice and to reflect on what are we missing but then let's go back again and do things very physically in the space actually the last big uh, show i made it's it's with an animal it's with an octopus and uh, and and some people around and it's very in parts very improvised so it's not at all giving away uh, to technology but i think theater has always been merging technologies and, and life art in a way. I mean, since Deus Ex Machina in, in the Roman or Greek times, um, Aristoteles has written about it uh, until nowadays. Um, and uh, obviously a lot of the illusions made in the Baroque theater have, have, have been very technical. And that's normal because our life is also um, very, influenced by technologies. I see here in the chat, there is a question about in or, or terms of audience participation, when you construct your work, do you design it in a way that it is, that is minimally restricts them or do you find it more information informative to draw stronger limitations to get clear cut away involvement such as perform a task or not but hmm. well, it's very difficult to answer this general huh? how much freedom or not to give i think basically audience is always free even in a classical performance where there, people normally are very restricted because they should shut up and sit in the dark and not stand up. And even if they're coughing, they disturb. But obviously you can, and that's probably an essence of, of live art, that you can stand up any moment you like and interrupt. And that's how, what we feel when we're together in a life uh, situation like this. Mm. But how much freedom or not to give, it's really, it really depends on which story do you want to tell, which experience you want to create. Um, for some of the, the I mean, the, the performance with the robot on stage, it's very, very traditional in the sense that you're sitting in a classical way, you're watching it and everything about all the reflections about freedom or not are going on in your mind. Whereas in Utopolis, that's another project a bit in continuation of the tradition of remote Istanbul. It's a performance where you can go closer or further away. You can be the first one or the last one in the row. You will see different things. You choose your perspective of all the time. So you have a lot of freedom in the physical way, but do you have in terms of, of thinking, yeah, it's, I mean, these are the, exper the interesting ex experiments. Eh? When you have in the theater, you have this freedom to choose where you want to watch, whereas cinema often kind of, often forces us to see this, you know, editing does make you look at this and then at this. And so it's a different 
it's it's quite manipulative there in the first term, but obviously there's tons of exceptions to this as well. I see here a hand up by Istanbul Fringe Festival. I give you allowance to speak here. So uh, sorry for the name. I'm Zeynep, one of the founders of Fringe Festival, Istanbul Fringe. Uh, and also I'm uh, doing my PhD on the intertwined relations between political and theater. So I'll get back to the uh, question about the political theater. Actually, in my teaching, uh, I always give the, uh, as a case study, the works of Rimini Protocol as a new way uh, of, uh, as a new form of political theater. Uh, I think there's a lot of parallelisms between your work and the uh, new public agency that we see in public square movements like Occupy Wall Street, Gezi, Istanbul, etc in the sense that uh, there is this social experimentation and um, there's public assembly of people and uh, maybe people who won't interact otherwise. So um, uh, my question would be on, uh, what do you think about this perspective of social experimentation? That for me, uh, um, that has a potential of uh, political imagination. Or maybe more simply, uh, do you think that is there any relation in this sense between your work and uh, public square movements? Well, I, I wasn't on Gezi Park myself, so I can't uh, really tell from first-hand experience what, um, what happened. But in all of these Occupy times, I think a part of, of what was reestablished was how do we want to be together and what kind of forms do we develop of spreading news of of you know amplifying uh, our speeches how can we be heard and um i guess this is on a, in in a, in a very simple way theater often is a bit of a place where we can experiment with formats of being together because we're deciding where and how do we how do we relate to to the others in the room to the others that we're looking at or um yeah i'm not sure if i'm answering it well but i i, I it definitely theater does 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 experiment on the on the social because it's the art form that you cannot do alone you know you can watch a film alone you can visit an exhibition alone but um, except for very particular pieces that are exactly made for being alone, mostly it is about the masses of people or people coming together and doing things together. Not sure I, if I answered that. Uh, um, but here is Berg that has still a question, I think. You can speak up if you want. It's not a question, mm -hmm. it's more like a Okay, <laughs> thank you, Berk. Yeah, I, I, I'm not intending to make you unemployed as actor, I can I swear. I, I anyway think, I mean, the more radical forms of theater we invent, the more they will produce uh, other radical forms of theater that go exactly the other way. Uh, so if, uh, if not in all of our projects, actually we did quite some projects also with actors and eh? so they might be less known, but we did also work every now and then, but um, I go and watch a lot of actors' performs, performances as well. Okay, I think kind of I see, yeah, maybe we should come to an end because also I'm, I feel a bit sorry for our translator who has already spent now one and two and a half hours almost uh, translating my 
already poor English into Turkish. So I don't know what's the ritual to end this, as I can't see you. Buzi, do you want to say something at the end, like to wrap it up? Okay. Hello. Well, um, thank you everyone for attending. Like it's been more than two hours nearly. <laughs> so thank you, Stefan, for your time. Um, this session will be um, recorded. Uh, it's already recorded. So we will share with you guys like uh, with Turkish sub subtitles as well. Uh, so if you miss um, any part and or if you would like to share and we go up, go back and uh, recap again, you will have opportunity to do that. So um, stay tuned, then we will uh, share with you the notify that, uh, when we share the recorded one. So um, thank you again for all, uh, everyone. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. For your time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody out there in the invisible space yeah. of Istanbul. Thank you.